we're here to talk to you about our carbon capture and storage plan. And um, if we go to the next slide, I want to talk just a little bit about ADM's uh, purpose and what we're focused on as a company. Um, we're really thinking about big trends that we're all looking at across the world when it comes to how we think about the entire value chain from the farm all the way to the fork. And so when you think about the big trends that we focus on, the same ones that we as all as, as human beings are looking at, it's, you know, what, is, what are we doing for food security? How are we making sure that the, the, the food that we're actually uh, growing from the ground is getting to the places where we do it? to the places where it's needed, right? And ADM is a big global company is trying to make sure that we identify the places of need and actually get transporting those products from point A to point B. Um, health and well-being, more and more people are looking for uh, that natural source of nutrition, right? And we think that food grown from the earth is the best way for us to think about nutrition holistically. And so as we look at food and the future of food, we think about how nature and our planet is helping make sure that health and well-being is part of everybody's life, and um, we know that you're part of that as well. And then certainly today, we're going to focus on sustainability. Um, all of this is only so good as we can continue to grow, we can continue to, to process, and we can continue to distribute the food products around the world that we need to, or the fuel or industrial products and feed that we're actually making. So we're going to spend some time talking to you about our carbon capture and, and storage program, which is part of our sustainability plan part of our purpose of unlocking nature to enrich life around the world. I've got David Rice here who is going to spend a lot of time giving you some insights into this. We are going to be taking questions today, so I've got a colleague who's going to have note cards. If you have a question at any point in time, just raise your hand. We'll make sure we get you a note card. Write that down. At the end of the session, I'm going to be making sure that these guys get grilled with all the tough ones, okay? So make sure you get those questions out. Thanks, David. Thanks, Brett. Except for the uh, hard questions, let's keep them to minimum, please. <laughs> uh, so uh, as Brett said, I've been uh, working on ADM's carbon capture and storage project. And it's uh, about a year and a half now. And every day, I'm learning a little bit more about it. Uh, I've been with ADM for 16 years. And um, one of the things that I, I always like to tell people is I'm always learning new things about the company and the different products we make um, every day. You know, I, I, I learn about a new ingredient that Adam's making that goes into some beverage or some food product or some industrial product that we, uh, that we use every day. And so I'm all constantly thinking about uh, the different, the, the ways that we can impact uh, different supply chains uh, across the consumer products we have. And one good way of kind of demonstrating or, or visualizing uh, where ADM plays in different supply chains is through this map. Um, and everything really starts with the land and the farmer, which I know many of you are producers and farmers yourselves. And so when we think about how does ADM participate in creating a more sustainable future for us and, and how do we help drive um, more sustainable products that we use um, on a daily basis, uh, we can start from the very beginning of the supply chain with, with the farmers. Um, I think, I, I'm hoping that a number of you have uh, went to visit Paul Sheets and our, our Climate Smart team uh, to talk about some of the region ag practices that they're, they're putting out there. Uh, these programs are kind of the, the, the starting point to start to reduce the carbon footprint of all of these products that ADM makes today. Um, things like cover crops, uh, tillage practices, crop inputs, these are all very important things and the, the, the first step to start to decarbonize the value chain. Um, from there, you know, ADM, uh, whether it's through our own transportation network or third parties, we transport those crops to our facilities or to other regions that need these crops. And ADM is um, implementing a number of initiatives to start to decarbonize that transportation. Um, some of the things many of you know, we make, ADM makes uh, ethanol and biodiesel. Well, the ADM-owned trucking fleet is looking at ways to uh, implement higher uh, ratios of biodiesel and uh, bio-based fuels into our own transportation fleet, uh, therefore reducing the environmental footprint of moving your crops to ADM facilities. Um, another thing that I, I recently learned that ADM is doing is uh, working with um, a cargo charter for ocean-going vessels where um, 
there's software and other tools that uh, will allow cargo ships to figure out what the best routing is to reduce the fuel they need to get from point A to point B, to move those crops from the US to China, to South America, wherever, right? And um, again, another way that ADM's trying to reduce the carbon usage or the carbon footprint of our transportation network. Um, after transportation, those crops arrived at the ADM facility, and uh, that's where I'm gonna unpack our carbon capture and storage a little bit more uh, later on, but that's where we are taking that, those, the corn, the soybeans, et cetera, and co converting that into either ingredients that will be used in food products, feed products, industrial or fuel, fuel products. And then kind of the, the rest of the value chain I talked a little bit about, but you know, that's where ADM is, um, plays in all sorts of markets. Um, one interesting thing, um, you know, we all probably shop online, get Amazon packages delivered to our home. Uh, the cardboard boxes that those, your goods arrive um, in, uh, a, a large part of that, uh, that packaging is made from cornstarch. Um, ADM actually supplies most, if not all, of the large um, corrugated box manufacturers uh, here in the U.S. So, you know, virtually, <laughs> I think there's something like 95% chance that on a daily basis you're going to use something or consume something that ADM, has an ADM product in it. So what is ADM specifically doing to address um, you know, our, our environmental uh, footprint? And um, uh, we, we have set out some targets uh, to address a, a number of issues such as water usage, um, land usage, et cetera. Um, but the one I'm gonna talk to you mostly about is our, our carbon emissions. Um, so back in, oh gosh, it's been a few years now, but a few years ago, ADM set uh, some targets to reduce our global greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the, the goal is to reduce our global emissions, scope one and two, so emissions that we generate, uh, CO2 emissions that we generate from you know, processing corn into ethanol, for example, uh, as well as our scope two emissions, which is uh, as we use electricity or natural gas, uh, the emissions associated with creating that electricity or natural gas, those emissions we're also measuring as well. And so we have a goal to re reduce those emissions by 25% by 2035 um, over our 2019 baseline. And as you can see, in 2019, we had around 16.4 million metric tons of, of these scope one and two emissions uh, globally. And uh, we're really proud that we were able to reduce that in the uh, end of 2022 by 7.8%. Um, but as you can see, we still have a lot of emissions to reduce. So um, that's where carbon capture and storage comes into play. And uh, we'll, we'll unpack that here now. So, you know, CCS is a, a big topic to cover. Uh, so I'm going to focus on ADM's capabilities. Um, and a lot of this stuff applies for CCS projects in other regions and by other operators. But uh, let's just focus on, you know, what ADM's doing today and, and what we have in, here in Decatur. So step number one for this process is just the act of capturing the CO2. And uh, ADM, as many of you know, we take corn and we'll go through a fermentation process to make ethanol. Uh, one of the byproducts off of the fermentation process is CO2. And uh, it's a relatively pure stream. Um, there's no other gases or things in it. Uh, there's a little bit of water or moisture um, that, that we collect. And so the first step is to collect that CO2, compress it, remove the rest of the, the water that might be in there, and make it a, virtually a, a high purity stream of CO2. Um, from there, we cool the CO2 down, and then we transport it via an underground pipeline to an injection site. Um, that injection site, and actually, uh, if any of you came in through the south uh, east gate, uh, you would have passed by one of ADM's uh, injection wells itself. And it's hard, it's hard to see because it's, there's really not much to see there. It's, uh, you know, there's no gases or things coming off of it. It's very quiet. It, it really goes unnoticed and has a very small footprint. 
So that's one of two uh, CCS injection wells that ADM uh, has today. So the pipeline from our ethanol plant will come underground to one of these injection sites, and there the CO2 is injected over a mile underground uh, to a formation that I'll talk about here shortly. Uh, and the final part is it's not enough just to uh, capture and store the CO2, but you have to make sure you're doing it in a responsible way. You know what's happening to that CO2. And that, that's where the final step comes in, uh, where you're monitoring, uh, you're, you're making sure you know where that CO2 is going, um, as well as uh, making sure you know what's happening over the long term and ensuring there's no leaks, et cetera. So um, that's essentially the ADM capabilities uh, that we have here in Decatur. Um, so, you know, one, I think for many of you, um, as you start to learn about CCS, uh, the natural questions that are going to come up are around safety. I I is it safe? And what, what are the things that ADM is doing to make sure that we prevent any potential leaks? Uh, we know what's going on with the, the, the CO2, et cetera. And so um, I think some of the key highlights here are around permitting, and then the community engagement aspect of it. Um, so I'll hit on permitting first. Um, the, there's a number of agencies that regulate the construction and operation of CO2 um, injection. Uh, and first and foremost, uh, the EPA has a program that's known as the Underground Injection Program, or Injection Control Program, UIC as an acronym. And under this program, they are, their mission is to make sure they're protecting drinking water sources, uh, mostly underground, but really anywhere. So any drinking water sources that, are, um, that we as humans use um, for drinking, um, you know, their, their focus is to make sure that ADM's not doing any, or operators are not doing anything that could potentially contaminate those sources. And so there's a very uh, comprehensive and rigid, or not rigid, but comprehensive and stringent uh, permitting process that the EPA requires. And so before an operator can start injecting or even constructing uh, an injection well, uh, the operator has to go through modeling, technical modeling, uh, scenario planning, uh, have processes and procedures in an event of an emergency, um, ways to monitor how the, the act, injection activities, et cetera. So it's, it's a very comprehensive set of requirements um, that the EPA um, puts forth. Um, there's also additional um, uh, permits that are, are needed, and, and they're out there to protect um, the environment, uh, wildlife, and, and humans. And, and so um, in terms of permitting processes, uh, you know, ADM, through our experience, we believe that there are all the necessary processes and procedures out there to make sure that operators are doing this in a safe and effective manner. So that's, that's kind of number one in terms of the safety aspect. Uh, number two, and I'm going to hit on these a little bit more here, is um, ADM, we, as I mentioned, we have two or one injection site over here and the other one is just a little bit further closer to the ADM plant. Uh, we've been operating these uh, injection wells for over a decade now. Uh, we've we've um, captured and stored over 3.9 million metric tons of CO2, and just rough calculations, I think that's somewhere around 700,000 cars, uh, an equivalent of that many cars taken off the road. Um, and as many of you know, the Decatur complex is ADM's largest asset we have globally not just the US, but globally. And you know what we like to tell people is like, it, it would be like you putting something in your backyard. Are you gonna put something in your backyard that you don't believe is safe? No. And, and so the fact that ADM felt that, or it has these injection sites right in our backyard, hopefully demonstrates that our belief that this technology is very safe um, and can be deployed in an effective manner and, and controlled. Um, and finally, for community engagement, um, obviously, you know, I think this technology is not something that's just for corporations or for operators. It, it's really something that ultimately is going to benefit society as a whole. Um, and specifically for the Decatur community, 
I, I'm going to talk about the kind of economic drivers, or I, I should say the the reasons why ADM's interested in this technology uh, later on, but we see a lot of economic growth potential for the Decatur area and other places where these projects could be deployed uh, because there's a lot of um, interest in decarbonizing um, manufacturing. Um, and it, it doesn't, it can't be just the manufacturers, the operators that are doing this. It's got to be a community uh, participation to, to deploy these technologies. So uh, ADM, um, we have started our community engagement over a year ago. It's actually probably been close to a year and a half where we've talked to various stakeholders ranging from landowners to um, you know, local governments and officials to you know, key decision makers and communities. Uh, all of these stakeholders are extremely important to make sure that a project gets executed the right way. And so uh, we believe in community engagement early and often, and uh, you know, hence why, frankly, we're here today is to continue our engagement education about the technology with, with all of you. Um, another question that we, we get a lot is, you know, why is ADM looking to do this in Decatur? What, what makes Decatur special? Um, and it, it really comes down to the geology. Um, the geology is really a, this natural resource or feature that uh, we have here in this area uh, that makes CCS a, a, a really good place to do it. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit in, a little bit more into the geology. I'm not a geologist by trade, but on the next slide, I'll kind of go through a rough diagram of what the what we have underneath our feet. Um, but um, kind of starting high level. What we have here, um, when the Earth was being formed uh, 500 million years ago, um, so pre-dinosaurs, pre-everything, <laughs> pre um, there was a, a formation created, uh, the Precambrian um, uh, granite formation, uh, which spans most of Illinois, as you see, and parts of Kentucky and Indiana. And think about this um, formation or this uh, feature as a, a bowl-shaped depression in the earth that's, you know, again, over a mile uh, below ground. Over time, this bowl-shaped depression was filled with sediment, uh, sand, and then other types of um, uh, materials that eventually layered on top of each other until present day. And uh, as you'll see on the next slide, the, the way that these layers formed, it created this natural storage feature uh, right beneath, beneath our feet. Now, these, this type of uh, geological feature isn't everywhere. There's only, a, there's only certain places in the US that actually have a feature like this. Um, there's, I believe, places up in Wyoming and, and North and South Dakota. There's places down in the Gulf Coast, so uh, Gulf Coast of Texas and Louisiana, and there's uh, certain places out in the West uh, in California. But not every place has this, and so um, states like Iowa and others uh, don't have the, the same features, and, and that's why we're not seeing project develop, projects being developed in, the, in those states. So to, to kind of understand a little bit more about the geology, this is a, a, a rough diagram, and it's really depicting kind of the prominent um, features of the, the geology we have. Um, in between some of these, there's additional layers of shale rock and sediment, et cetera. But what we want to focus on are the, the kind of the key components that make the storage site uh, very attractive for, for CCS. So um, I'm actually going to start at the, the, the bottom of this diagram. And uh, I talked about that bowl-shaped uh, depression. That's uh, what's known as a Precambrian basement, uh, which is a very hard granite rock um, that's uh, impermeable for, for water and gases and things. So it acts as the basement of the, the storage facility. Um, on top of that, then you have the Mount Simon sandstone or Mount Simon reservoir. And that's, the, that's where ADM is looking to inject, or currently injects CO2. And um, that's, that's essentially the storage space uh, for the CO2. And, and if you can look at the, the numbers, these are all in feet. So you can see that um, that, that storage space starts at about 5,500 feet 
and goes all the way down to about 7,000 feet to the, to the Precambrian basement. So it's a very, very tall um, storage facility. Um, and it happens that Decatur actually is in kind of the sweet spot of this bowl. We're in kind of the deepest part, um, which again is, is why Decatur is very attractive for deploying this technology. Um, above that then, above the, mount, the sandstone, you have the Eau Claire shell. And so that Eau Claire shell starts at around 5,000 feet and is about um, 550 feet thick. Uh, shell rock, if you guys aren't familiar with it, is, is, is a very dense impermeable rock, meaning uh, gases, liquids cannot flow through it. It's a very tight um, air gaps um, that you know, prevent any passage of, of gases and liquids. Um, and then, so the, the Eau Claire shell acts as the cap rock to our storage facility. Um, and that's what's going to keep that CO2 that we've injected in place and prevent it from going up toward the, the surface. Um, in addition to this initial cap rock, we have two more layers of shell that are very prominent. Um, the Mococa shell and the New Albany shell. And these shell layers act as secondary and tertiary um, layers of protection that in the event, a very unlikely event, that there were CO2 to kind of pass through that first cap rock, you have additional layers of protection to, that will stop the CO2 from getting to the surface or to any drinking water sources. Um, and then we, we like to call out where drinking water is around here, because that, that's obviously of, of <laughs> importance. Um, and um, as many of you know, uh, if you live around here, Drinking water wells 200 feet deep, maybe 300 tops. Um, and Lake Decatur, which is a, obviously a, a source of drinking water, um, 22 feet at the deepest, and that's after we dredged um, um, the bottom of the, <laughs> of the lake out. So um, all of the CO2 injection you can see is happening well below um, any drinking water sources. Um, and what I don't have pointed out here, but as, as often the question I get is, you know, how does this impact mineral rights, such as oil, gas, or um, other things like that? And, and most of that stuff in this region um, is around that 24, 26,000 feet, so around kind of between the New Albany shell, Makokoda shell. So again, all of those minerals and natural resources are well above where we're looking to inject CO2. So what you're seeing here are samples that uh, geologists have pulled. These are actual samples that we pulled from uh, the ground underneath us. And the furthest to the left is uh, core samples of the Precambrian basement. And it, um, you can see that there's, and I'll have another slide to kind of show a zoomed in view of, of this rock. Um, the middle slide is the sandstone that was, and this is actual, again, core samples taken from this area of the Mount Simon sandstone. Um, the, the picture to the right is actually uh, a zoomed in view of that same sandstone. And from this picture, you can see these little air spaces between the granules of sand. Um, that's what's known as um, pore space. And that's where the CO2 is, uh, resides when it's injected into the ground. Um, and there's two concepts when you think about pore space and what makes uh, sandstone very suitable for uh, carbon storage. There's two terms that uh, scientists like to use, uh, porosity and permeability. Um, porosity is essentially the measure of how much airspace you have between these granules of, of sand. So the higher the porosity, the more airspace you have. Um, permeability is essentially the connectivity of those, um, that, that, those air spaces to one another. And why are these two things important? Well, obviously, porosity, the more porosity you have, the more holding capacity of CO2 you have per unit of volume. Permeability is, the, is important because it allows that CO2 that we've compressed and is in, in a, a more of a liquid form, it allows that CO2 to kind of flow through the, the formation, um, therefore allowing somebody who's injecting CO2 into the ground 
it allows us it allows that CO2 to slowly kind of spread out, and you can continue to use inject more CO2 into the same uh, into the same well. Um, this is a, a, a close up of the shell layer that um, makes up the Eau Claire shell, the New Albany, and the Maquoketa shell layers. And you can see here versus the other picture of the sandstone, um, you know, very hard to, there's virtually no air spaces. Um, so low, very low porosity and permeability, uh, preventing gases and, and liquids from moving through it. So again, this is, this is the, the cap rock and the second and third layers of protection that we have to make sure that CO2 does not migrate back to the surface. So um, how does ADM intend to use this technology? And you know, back at the beginning, I, I kind of talked about ADM's decarbonization journey, um, you know, all the different areas that ADM plays in, and all the different products we make, quite frankly, that we use on an everyday basis. And so by taking this technology, it enables ADM to decarbonize all the products that we use today that go into all the different um, consumer goods that we have. And um, so we, we see this technology as almost a, an infrastructure that will allow us to start to build on top of that um, new projects to further decarbonize ADM's um, footprint. And some of those projects that um, have been publicly announced and, and we are working on are, are these three here. Um, the first one um, is uh, a few years back, uh, ADM announced um, the potential or work that we are working with a company on a low carbon emission steam and power plant. And, and that company is looking actually to build a new facility here in Decatur. Um, and in order for that technology to work, you need to have the CCS capability um, to be able to take the, any emissions that are generated from the production of, of power and steam and to be able to s permanently store that underground. So, so that's, that's uh, the first project. And now I should mention that this project is um, still being developed, but the idea is um, you know, ADM would be an off taker of the, that um, steam and power, but they're also looking to be able to connect to the electrical grid. So consumers such as yourselves uh, will have the opportunity to get low carbon intensity uh, energy or they'll be feeding low carbon intensity um, into the grid. Um, the second project uh, that ADM had uh, announced is one where we're working with uh, um, a pipeline company, well, two pipeline companies, but the second one is with um, a company called Wolf Carbon Solutions. Uh, Wolf Carbon Solutions is a, a company based out of Denver, Colorado. Um, and they have a parent company that owns and operates the longest um, pipeline, active pipeline um, in, in North America in Alberta, Canada. Um, this, this pipeline is currently transporting CO2 to a storage site in Canada. And, and one of the things that we really like about Wolf Carbon Solutions is the way that they've executed their project. Um, they, they're proud to say that um, between the collective group of, of people at Wolf, that they have not used uh, the use of eminent domain to install that pipeline. And so that is, that is what attracted ADM to Wolf Conference Solutions and why we think that they're going to be a really good partner for us to, uh, to help us decarbonize um, ADM assets. The, uh, the last project I'll hit on is um, a similar project. Um, ADM operates a ethanol plant in Columbus, Nebraska, and, and likewise, we want to be able to decarbonize that, that asset as well. Uh, geographically, there are storage sites um, that are closer to Columbus than Decatur, Illinois, and so we are looking to partner with uh, Tall Grass Energy, who will take a, an existing natural gas pipeline that's been decommissioned, and they'll repurpose it to transport CO2 from ADM to uh, their own storage site in Wyoming. So again, projects that ADM's actively doing to, to really make meaningful uh, movements in our carbon emissions. And uh, you know, finally, um, when I think about all the work we've done, and, and like I said at the beginning, I've only been doing this for a year and a half, but there's ADM people who've been doing this for over a decade. 
and some of our partners have been doing this for over 20 years. And so we are proud to, to be partnered with such great companies like the Illinois State Geological Survey, um, Richland Community College. Uh, Richland, if many of you may or may not know, they actually have a curriculum for students to learn specifically about carbon capture and storage. Um, and in fact, I think they're gonna be graduating their first class of students here in the next year or so. So these students are gonna be the ones that are gonna actually be taking this te technology and using it at a full scale. Um, so, you know, workforce development, making sure that people are trained to be able to operate these systems uh, safely. Uh, we also work very closely with the DOE and the National Energy Technology Laboratory, um, as well as obviously the EPA. Uh, EPA has been great partners uh, with us. Um, we've worked very closely with the EPA on our first two wells. And in fact, we like to tell people, or a, a, a fact that we like to tell people is, these two wells that we have are the first uh, EPA permitted class six wells in the US. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of companies out there that actually come to Decatur because they're interested in deploying this technology and they know that ADM has, um, has successfully uh, demonstrated we can do this safely. So a lot of, lot of interest from uh, companies in the US and really around the world. So that, that's about all I have here. Um, I think Brett, um, oh, yep, I'll, I'll turn it back to Brett uh, for a little bit of Q&A. Thanks, Stephen. Um, talking about safety, I was worried if you were gonna fall off the stage a couple times. I don't know if anybody else was, but I'm glad he didn't do that. Um, we're gonna uh, look for questions. So if you've got a question that, uh, that came up, I've got one over here, uh, just raise your hand. We'll make sure you get a card. Um, write that down and we'll, uh, We'll pose it. I've got a couple that have come up in previous conversations I'm going to start with so we can have a couple minutes here. Um, first and foremost, David, um, and I think we may have Jim Hoyt joining us too. I'm sorry, you're going to go up here? We can go. We can sit down. Why not? Sounds good. Sit down. So um, maybe the starting question I would put out there is uh, safety. I know we talked about safety a couple of times here. Um, but uh, when we connect safety with monitoring, uh, David, uh, we talked a little bit about the safety of injection. We talked about the safety of the water wells. Um, two that I've heard are, how do we make sure this isn't contaminating water and what are we doing to monitor that? The other is, how are we monitoring for any seismic activity? Because I think people wonder, you're injecting uh, CO2 deep, deep underground, and yes, it, it stopped there, but how are we making sure that there aren't any seismic activities um, happening above ground? Yeah, both really good questions. So. Um the first question about water and how do we monitor to make sure there's not, we're not contaminating uh, drinking water sources. Um, so there's a, a couple different things that uh, we do and, and our partners do. Uh, the first is uh, before we even start injecting, uh, we have to construct a, a, a model, a computer simulation that essentially um, is a model of the geology below our feet. And that model will then get overlaid with uh, injection, like simulation of uh, injection of CO2. And what that model will tell us is, what will that CO2 do over a period of time? Where does it move? Um, how does it react uh, with the environment uh, underground? And so uh, the e per our permitting requirements, we need to update that model based on the actual CO2 we injected and make sure that we uh, have a full understanding of where that's gone. Um, so modeling is the, the first step to making sure we, we know, we can predict where that CO2 is gonna go. And uh, again, all of this is occurring well below drinking water sources. So uh, the likelihood of, of, of CO2 um, breaking containment and, and move, migrating toward the surface is, is, to begin with, is very unlikely. In the event that, you know, maybe CO2 were to, to migrate upward, um, we do, uh, we're also required to have monitoring wells. And so uh, we have both deep monitoring wells that go all the way down into the storage facility where we can take samples of that, um, that material down in the storage facility and, and pull that back up to the surface and measure for any presence of CO2. 
Um, we also have shallow monitoring wells, which are actually um, drilled to the depth of drinking water sources in the area. And, and same thing, we can pull samples of that drinking water back up to the surface and analyze it to see if there's any presence of CO2. So those are uh, a couple of ways that we uh, make sure that uh, we're controlling and making sure there's no leaks and contamination of, of drinking water sources. To the question on seismicity and, and making sure that you know, our operations are not the cause of a, an earthquake. Um, so uh, geologists have been monitoring seismic activity for a long time and obviously that's how we know the size of an earthquake when, that, when it occurs. Um, and so using that same technology, uh, we, can, we, can mo we are constantly monitoring seismic activity in the area. And there are, per our permit, if there's any detection that the seismic activity is getting above a certain level, we are required to stop down injection operations and investigate what's happening. Um, and, these, and these limits that are in place are well below anything that we would detect at the surface. So there's um, rules and procedures and, and uh, monitoring systems in place to make sure that uh, we cease any kind of injection operation and, and investigate what's going on uh, well before it, it could cause a, a bigger problem. Thank you. Got a couple? Take a look at these. Okay. Let's take a look at these here. Okay. Um, so one here, which is, okay, over the past 10 years, we talked about having stored um, three plus million tons of CO2 under a uh, Decatur. Um, as we think about the next nine years or 10 years, um, we might have collected over 40 million tons, depending on the modeling that we do. Um, how do we, how much, what's the capacity, I guess, of storage over time? I mean, whether it's a decade or this, this person's asking over the next century even. So I'm not sure if we want to go out 100 years, but maybe some thoughts on modeling. Yeah, no, um, so I'll, I'll start off maybe high level and, and Something that I had up on the slide but I didn't talk a lot about is the size of the Illinois Basin. So if you recall on the slide, I had, I think it was somewhere north of 110,000 square miles is the size of the Illinois Basin. And as you think about that in terms of then you project that downward and you look at the, the height of the storage space and kind of the geometry of it, um, scientists believe that there's uh, well over 100 billion tons of storage, CO2 storage capacity in this feature. Uh, and when you think about 100 billion tons, like what does that mean? I, I have a hard time grasping what that means, but um, what, I've, what I've learned is um, it is enough storage space to take all of the CO2 emissions that we generate today in kind of this Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, uh, even Iowa, this entire region, and it has enough storage capacity to capture all that, sequester it, uh, and store it there for well over 100 years. So um, that's kind of the best way I can think about describing the, the capacity. Um, it's really, it's, it's hard to comprehend um, uh, the immensity of it. So, um, but yeah, there, there's well over 100 years of, of capacity if we were to look at kind of the emissions we create in this, in this region. Okay. So that was a 100-year question. Thank you for getting to 100. Um, pretty good. Uh, so another question is, um, is there any way we could actually be using the CO2 in any other way other than storing it? Is there a plan to do something with it once it's pushed underground? Or is there any way we could be using it more efficiently than what we're currently doing? Yep. Um, so there are technologies that are being worked on to take CO2 and actually use it as a feedstock to make other things such as uh, chemicals or plastics or even to the extent of making food. Um, there's, there's companies out there that can take uh, the air that we breathe and they have processes that uh, can convert that air into protein. So there's a lot of work out there being done on how do we be, become, how do we kind of have a circular economy where we're taking waste products that we, we generate and repurpose those for new consumer products. So a lot of things being worked on. The thing is, is 
these technologies aren't ready to be scaled up yet. Um, so uh, we need, um, you know, we talked about ADM's um, greenhouse gas emission targets, reducing our emissions by 25% by 2035. Uh, the problem is, is some of these technologies aren't going to be ready by 2035, and we really need to start addressing um, our, our climate emissions sooner. Um, and so uh, we think you can do both. We, we want to be able to um, deploy this technology, start reducing our emissions, and once, you know, and I guess this is my personal belief, but once these technologies are ready to go, we already have systems and a feedstock that's, that's ready. Um, we have concentrated amounts of CO2, we're collecting it. So uh, you could see that developing a commercial scale plant, maybe here in Decatur, and feeding it with the CO2 instead of putting it underground, that definitely could be a, a possibility in the future. Um, this is a good question. It's one I have, and I, I, I've, I've asked this in the past. So it all sounds really good to be saving the world and all that good stuff, but there's got to be money involved in this, right? Because um, I think there's a commercial opportunity across multiple fronts. One is, you know, w what are we doing to ensure that, you know, this has commercial viability for, from an ADM perspective? But the question here is, what's the financial benefit to the farmer or the landowner in this case as well? Yeah, th and that's a good question. So um, to answer it directly, um, ADM uh, and, and uh, the Wolf Carbon Solutions, our, our uh, partner on the pipeline part of it, um, there is compensation being offered to landowners that uh, are impacted by the project. So um, there is direct financial compensation from that perspective. But I think the bigger picture is um, longevity. Uh, you know, a lot of us have kids, we want to make sure we're leaving them off with something that's valuable. Um, and so I think twofold, one, the value is we're creating markets for, we're creating long-term markets for the crops that uh, many of us produce today, corn, soybeans, et cetera. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, whether or not we get to enjoy those in our lifetime or it, it's likely that it's going to be uh, something that our, our children, children's children can benefit from down the road. And ultimately, that's what a lot of us are really concerned about is, you know, a lot of us want to have assets that we can then pass on to our generations. And what better way than, of doing that than creating a market that's sustainable that uh, is kind of, you know, less impacted by currency valuations and things like that, but we're actually making a product that is needed for consumers around the world. So I, I think that's, in my mind, is, is kind of the benefits, the economic benefit for, for a lot of us here in this room. Well, thanks for the questions I've got. And I think that we answered questions about um, uh, both how we're con continuing to think about uh, the financial connection to this. We've talked about uh, some of the testing and monitoring procedures that people had a question about. There were quite a few questions about uh, you know, how much space we actually have and how long we think we can, we can store it in. I've got somebody frantically writing down here, so we'll wait for your question to come in just a second here. Thank you. Um, and uh, you know, as we get into that, I, I want to make sure that we're you know, also thinking about like, the next steps. You talked a little bit about what's happening here, David, from a perspective of um, you know, we've got two wells. Uh, we're, we're, we're obviously um, applying for permits uh, to go to, to sort of further that. W what do we see as sort of the next steps, and what are the process that we have to take to be able to get to those um, expansion of the current capability? Yep. Um, so uh, a couple things, and, and a lot of these things we're doing actively doing, and we started the process um, you know over a year ago, and it, it has to do with the technical modeling, making sure we understand you know, what's going to happen if we add ejection wells, um, you know, what, how is that CO2 going to behave in relation to the other injection wells in the area, um, making sure that we have the right um, safety procedures in place, emergency response procedures, and uh, monitoring activities. So all of that is stuff that we, we have to do before we can even start drilling a well. Um, in addition to that, and really in parallel to that, it's it's back to that community engagement, kind of what we're here to do today, and what what ADM's been doing for the last year and a half is is working with the community to get the information out there, get the science be out there, answer questions about the technology. So 
uh, again, back to the comment of uh, stakeholder engagement is uh, our, our ethos is early and often. We gotta be, be meeting with you guys as much as we can, understand your concerns, make sure we're answering any questions you have. So those are all things that we've started and will continue to do. Um, and then aside from that, it's kind of more the, kind of the administrative processes that are in place by agencies, et cetera. So we'll continue to work through the permitting processes, et cetera. Um, but uh, once we have everything lined out and done, you know, checked all the boxes, then becomes the next steps of execution um, and, and installing um, these, these assets that we, we see as very valuable and critical. All right, I'm gonna go back to um, the, the financial question and thanks for this question. So uh, we, you talked about markets being created and markets that may be something that would be valuable for generations to come. Uh, this question was asking like, t tell me a little bit more about those markets. What are the types of markets we're actually talking about, especially the market for the farmer, the, the producer, right? What, what market are we actually thinking that that's going to be uh, delivering to and what's the opportunity for that farmer um, on that space? Yeah, uh, this, this one I'd really like to talk about. And, and uh, the other part of my job is actually working with um, companies, uh, third-party companies, uh, to figure out how are we going to develop uh, new products that, that consumers are needing. Uh, and one that you've, you, many of you may have heard of recently is uh, this uh, sustainable aviation fuel, um, or SAF for short. Uh, SAF is essentially replacing conventional jet fuel made from petroleum with something that's more uh, sustainable or viable. And, and it could be in the form of taking um, you know, waste streams and converting them to jet fuel, or it could be taking plant, other plant-based materials. Um, and so ADM is looking to, um, you know, as many of you know, our core business is around converting uh, crops that you guys grow, corn, soybeans, et cetera, into all these different products. Um, there's technologies out there that can take ethanol, uh, the, the ethanol that we produce today, and convert it into sustainable aviation fuel. And what we believe is uh, a financially economical way with some of the recent federal uh, funding programs that are in place. So um, we, th we see sustainable aviation fuel being a needle mover in terms of the ethanol industry and, and Argo, you know, you who, uh, the, the, the corn production in the US. So um, that, that's one area. And then the, the other area that I like to talk about is, is kind of the, the bioplastic space. Um, some of you may, if you follow kind of ADM announcements, um, in the last uh, year or two, we made an announcement uh, forming two joint ventures with uh, LG Chem. Um, LG Chem is looking to take um, a technology that converts corn dextrose uh, into a bioplastic or what's called uh, polylactic acid. And so JV1 is gonna be focused on taking dextrose and converting it to lactic acid, the, the basic uh, monomer. And then the JV2 will take that lactic acid and convert it into polylactic acid, which is then used uh, to make these bioplastics. And, and these, uh, these two JVs are looking to be, um, uh, be built here, right here in Decatur. Um, and in order, to, um, in order to make these bioplastics more environmentally friendly and, and kind of fit the, the mission that ADM has, uh, this is where CS, CCS can come into play by being able to capture um, any CO2 emissions uh, needed for the fermentation of that dextrose to lactic acid or uh, by um, potentially, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the steam and power plant. So, you know, being able to have a low carbon intensity energy source to, to run that, um, that lactic acid production process. So those are two things that we're really excited about. Um, and there's, there's many more um, things, opportunities out there. Thanks, I mean, and for those of you who don't know, know polylactic acids and everything that you were talking about, the one thing somebody told me one time is that by using that, we can actually replace petroleum-based products such as super absorbent diapers with something that has plant-based properties. So we have a plant-based diaper out there in the future. I'm not sure if exactly that's the right technology, but uh, that gives you a sense of it. Jim, we didn't get to you. I guess the, t the questions never got tough enough. Uh, 
So I'm sorry we couldn't. Uh, we couldn't. Jeff, uh, Jim's our resident expert. Been around for a long time doing this as well. Um, if we have questions, you know, feel free to grab us. We're going to be around all day. Thank you for the questions that did come in. It really is important for us to answer these. We've got a table over here with lots more information. David's there uh, for the rest of today. Thank you very much. Great, great having you, and we'll talk soon. Thank you.